You're listening to Motivation Chaser, a show about finding inspiration in the books we read, movies we watch, and music we listen to. I'm Fabian Rodriguez. Motivation Chaser is brought to you by Full Stack. When you're a founder, you get used to doing it all. You sometimes forget that somebody else could do it better, faster, or cheaper. That's where Full Stack PEO comes in. They specialize in turnkey HR for emerging companies, not just payroll and benefits, but advice and expert services that help you and your people maximize potential. Find out more at fullstackpeo.com. So I told you guys an embarrassing part of my past on the last episode with Jennifer Broxterman. I only mentioned it briefly, so maybe you didn't catch it, but I'll mention it again. When I was a freshman in high school, I used to weigh 300 pounds. That's a lot, like an unhealthy amount a lot. And I'm about six feet tall now, but back then I was like two inches shorter and I was born with a perfectly round head. So you can begin to imagine what I look like. If you've ever seen that gif of that chubby little kid dancing because it's Taco Tuesday, that was pretty much me. And I had a lot of self-confidence issues back then. And I think that's where I developed my thick skin and sense of humor. I needed it to be able to carry on without letting what people said get to me. It's also where I developed my obsession with working out, being active, and pushing myself to do utterly miserable things like CrossFit competitions and running half and full marathons. Over the course of my freshman year and the summer leading up to my sophomore year, I managed to drop over 100 pounds. It was no easy feat, but I was determined to drop that weight. And since then, I've pretty much kept it all off, but I've struggled from time to time. And recently, I felt like I've been in a rut. COVID-19 essentially decimated the community of friends I would work out with every morning, and working out in a cold garage every day has somewhat lost its allure. And a friend of mine, You know who he is, the one and only Jeff DuPont, the Jeff DuPont who helps make this show sound as great as it does, told me about the Nike Plus Run Club app. He said he'd been using it to track his runs and it helped him drop a bunch of weight this summer. And Jeff, he looks great by the way. He looks younger and healthier than I've ever seen him over the last three years or so of our friendship. Anyway, he told me about the app he was using and I was intrigued. So the latest incarnation of Nike's running app is the Nike Plus Run Club, which offers a powerful community and training focused experience. Now Nike's running app was given a huge overhaul back in 2016, and it's now one of the best running apps on the Apple Watch. And sorry for all of you Strava lovers out there, but I think Nike's got you beat. Now I prefer to use the app on my iPhone because I find the experience just using my Apple Watch a little bit too cumbersome but I've read many positive reviews of people who love using the app solely on their watches. So if that's your thing, go for it. But the cool thing about the app and why it keeps me running is that there are detailed training plans across a range of distances, guided runs with audio coaching, easy music syncing with either Apple Music or Spotify, and you can even create a training plan using the My Coach feature. For instance, check this out. Welcome to the Nike Plus Run Club app. I'm Coach Bennett, the Nike Plus Run Club Global Head Coach. Super impressive title. Basically, it means I think I can help you get through this run the right way, a better way. Pausing workout. However, the best and most motivating part about the app has to be the achievements. The Nike Plus Run Club app gives you shiny little badges for things like your fastest 5K or longest run and special recognition for different successes like running on holidays, running on your birthday, putting together various types of run streaks, and completing monthly or weekly run challenges. Now, if it sounds like this is a Nike ad, I promise you it's not although I wouldn't be opposed to it if they paid me the right amount of money. But I just wanted to share something with you that's been bringing me joy, something that's been keeping me healthy and challenging my mind and body at a time when I was falling into one of those funks. Coming up, I'll tell you what I've been reading, watching, and listening to since the last episode. We'll start with a quick but effective book called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. As I was struggling to get the episode done this week, I thought about this book. It was recommended to me a while back by a friend, and ironically, 
I only made it about a third of the way through the first time, and then I didn't open it back up again until this past week. I'd originally heard about the War of Art from Joe Rogan, as he used to talk about it all the time and would even give it away to many of his guests. If you don't know about Stephen Pressfield or the War of Art, I'll provide you with some quick background information on both. Stephen Pressfield is an American author of historical fiction, nonfiction, and screenplays. His first book, The Legend of Bagger Bands, was published in 1995 and was made into a 2000 film starring Will Smith, Charlize Theron, and Matt Damon. His second novel, Gates of Fire, is about the Spartans and the battle at Thermopylae. It is taught at the U.S. Military Academy, the United States Naval Academy, and the Marine Corps Basic School at Quantico. Pressfield wrote The War of Art in 2002, and in it, explains the concept of resistance that is faced by artists, entrepreneurs, athletes, and others who are trying to break through their creative barriers by overcoming their self-doubt, vanity, fear, and self-sabotage. So now that you know a little bit about Pressfield and his book, The War of Art, I wanted to tell you why I chose to talk about it this week. One, it's only like 165 pages long, so it's easy to get through in one sitting, and I really wanted to feel a sense of accomplishment. Two, as somebody who works in the quote-unquote creative space, I could relate to almost everything that he wrote about. In the last solo episode I did, I told you how I was struggling with procrastination and how I believed that my own fear was the root cause. Well, that hypothesis was confirmed. And if you choose to read the book, you'll immediately find out that resistance is what keeps us from doing our work. And our work is a battle that we must wake up willing to fight every day. It is the insidious and invisible enemy within. The book is full of easy to digest chapters that feel more like long scribblings in a notebook or something that you'd write on a sticky note and place it on your mirror. For instance, listen to this. Resistance will tell you anything to keep you from doing your work. It will perjure, fabricate, falsify, seduce, bully, cajole. Resistance is protean. It will assume any form if that's what it takes to deceive you. It will reason with you like a lawyer or jam a nine millimeter in your face like a stick up man. Resistance has no conscience. It will pledge anything to get a deal, then double cross you as soon as your back is turned. If you take resistance at its word, you deserve everything you get. Resistance is always lying and always full of shit. And there's one specific chapter in here that I connected with more than any other. It's called How to Be Miserable. This might sound terrible, but if you were paying attention, you would already know that I'm a glutton for punishment and willing to endure the suck longer than most. That said, hearing Pressfield's take on the value of tolerating misery made me smile and gave me hope. I'll read that chapter for you before moving on, but I urge anyone who's been battling with procrastination or creator's block to pick up this book and give it a read. In my younger days dodging the draft, I somehow wound up in the Marine Corps. There's a myth that Marine training turns baby-faced recruits into bloodthirsty killers. Trust me, the Marine Corps is not that efficient. What it does teach, however, is a lot more useful. The Marine Corps teaches you how to be miserable. This is invaluable for an artist. Marines love to be miserable. Marines derive a perverse satisfaction in having colder chow, crappier equipment, and higher casualty rates than any outfit of dog faces, swab jockeys, or fly boys, all of whom they despise. Why? Because these candy asses don't know how to be miserable. The artist committing himself to his calling has volunteered for hell, whether he knows it or not. He will be dining for the duration on a diet of isolation, rejection, self-doubt, despair, ridicule, contempt, and humiliation. The artist must be like that Marine. He has to know how to be miserable. He has to love being miserable. He has to take pride in being more miserable than any other soldier or swabby or jet jockey because this is war, baby, and war is hell. Coming up next... I'll tell you guys about a Netflix show that's helped me unlock a new creative part of my brain. You're listening to Song Exploder, where musicians take apart their songs and piece by piece tell the story of how they were made. My name is Rishikesh Hirway. 
I want to talk about one of my favorite podcasts that recently got picked up by Netflix and now has its own show. The podcast is called Song Exploder, and at the time that I recorded this, there were only four episodes available. If you haven't heard of it, Song Exploder is a podcast where musicians take apart their songs and piece by piece tell the story of how they were made. That show was actually a huge inspiration for Motivation Chaser in the way that this show is produced. Anyway, I watched an episode of Song Exploder on Netflix with Ty Dolla Sign. It was talking about his song LA from his debut album, Free TC. And what I loved about it and why it was so motivating for me is that it gave me a behind the scenes look at how the audio podcast is actually produced. As a kinesthetic learner, this was huge because I could visually see how Reshikesh Herway approached his craft. I could see him asking questions and I could see the guest answer them. Now you might be thinking, okay, cool, so what? Who cares that you could see them? Well, I care, damn it. And if you've never listened to the show, you would know that you never really hear the host asking questions. The story is told using only the guest audio. So there's always been this kind of mystery as to what Reshi Kesh was asking his guests to elicit the answers that we hear as the final product. Additionally, the visual component of the show is beautiful. The B-roll and the animation really got me engaged and added more depth to the interview and the song. The show is super cool, and I'm looking forward to binging more episodes. I'll play the trailer for you next and hope that you guys go check it out. You never know how a song is going to come together. Music to me is all about textures. It's so raw. You're opening your heart to someone and you're not sure where it's gonna land. Wait for it. Let me show you what I mean. Let me show you what's in my head. They go. When the drums come in, it feels like a different language. It was so pretty that I wanted it to feel more like rough. I don't want to sound like anybody. I may go through five bass players to get to the actual bass line that I want. I'm that psycho. Everything about Burr is not only in the lyrics, but in the melody. Losing my religion is kind of a mistake. The fact that it became what it became is still puzzling to all of us. I don't mind being famous. It's not that bad. Sampha had just lost his mother, and I had just had a son. It was this beautiful circle. To give it word was what the journey was about. It's a chance. I'm not going to find the right words. I'm not going to find the right melody. And then there's another chance. This might be the day that you write that thing that you never knew you had in you. And last, we'll get a bit contentious to figure out what the best hip-hop album of 2020 has been so far. So a couple of weeks ago, I put a post out there on social media asking people what the best hip-hop album of 2020 was so far. A lot of folks wrote back with the answer RTJ4, the new Run the Jewels album. And while this album is great, it was something that I'd already listened to several times over and wasn't sold that it was actually the best album of the year so far. Then somebody recommended Alfredo by Freddie Gibbs. And I was like, what the hell? Freddie Gibbs? The dude from Gary, Indiana who does gangster rap? No thank you. No way that this could be the best hip hop record of 2020. But as with most things, I'm always curious and keep an open mind. So I dove in. The next morning, I put my AirPods in, walked into the gym, and hit play on Alfredo, the 2020 album from Freddie Gibbs and The Alchemist. And what I heard was unlike anything I had expected. Having never given Freddie Gibbs a chance, I made a judgment about who he was and how he creates his music. And lucky for me, I was wrong. Freddie is a great storyteller. You actually believe the things that he raps about. He also has this great flow and impeccable wordplay. He's all the best parts of some of my favorite rappers like Tupac, Kendrick Lamar, and J. Cole. Now I have to say, in my opinion, 
Alfredo isn't the best hip hop album of 2020 so far. I still think that Mac Miller's posthumous release Circles holds that title for me, but listening to Alfredo got me excited. It made me go back into his archive and listen to all of Freddie Gibbs' music. And it's good. Like, really good. So, shout out to Brad Pope for the recommendation. You've helped expand my musical universe. And that's it. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, share, and review the show. And if you're interested in finding out more about anything that I talked about in this episode, be sure to check out the show notes for links to everything, including all the music that we used. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Motivation Chaser podcast. This show is hosted and edited by me, Fabian Rodriguez, mixed and mastered by the one and only Jeff DuPont. 